This is Naomi Oreskes, who's actually just been um, made provost of Sixth College here um, at UC San Diego, um, uh, but is best known for her history and science studies, a uh, lot of work on climate. And her new book, this is what I'm looking forward to, is forthcoming book is called Fighting Facts with the obligatory 83-word <laughs> subtitle. We might change the subtitle. <laughs> how, how a handful of scientists have muddied the waters on environmental issues from tobacco to global warming as they wandered their way from San Diego. No, no, no. That was, yeah. that was <laughs> Naomi Oreskes. Anyway. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roger. It's nice to be here. Um, actually, I think the subtitle is actually called The Tobacco Road to Global Warming. I think that's what we're going to use. But anyway, um, well, so thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. This morning was kind of a feel-good session, and now I get to launch the feel-bad session. So I want to just start by saying a couple things about the premises of this conference, which it seems to me is essentially a kind of premise in, the, in a belief in science and a conviction that science has the power to change the world. Now, that's a conviction that I share and that I think as a historian of science is amply demonstrated by the empirical evidence of history. But there's something else going on here that I, I want to maybe um, question to a certain extent, and that's the metaphor of the candle in the dark. So as we all know Carl Sagan advocated that idea towards the end of his life, but there's something about that metaphor that troubles me, and one of the things that troubles me is that it carries some not so helpful implications. So it seems to me it carries the implication that most ordinary people are stumbling around in the dark, uh, so it's not a very flattering implication to the publics we may wish to speak to, and that it's somehow up to us as superior and more enlightened people to enlighten them. And as a scholar of science studies, that's a very familiar theme, a theme that we call the deficit model. That is to say that the problem with the public is a deficit of knowledge, education, and cognitive skills when it comes to understanding science. So the deficit model tends to lead in response to what I call a supply side response. That is to say, if the problem is a deficit on the part of the public, then the appropriate response is to remedy it with a surplus of knowledge through public education, K-12 science education, statements on web pages, and various other ways to supply the public with the necessary information. So just a couple of examples of this. Many of the scientific societies that I am a member of have statements on climate change, including this AGU revised statement in 2008. And if you have a lot of time and are very patient, you could actually read it. Uh, or this one that's a little bit more attractive visually, the AAAS Press Room, their climate change town hall, still takes a lot of time to read. And it's not clear to me that an ordinary member of the public would be able to read this, much less even know that it exists. Um, but there's many of these efforts out there, all done in goodwill, all done as good faith efforts on the part of people who do them, intelligent people. But nevertheless, the empirical evidence suggests that these supply side efforts have not been effective. So to persuade you of that, and to persuade you that maybe we need to think differently about how we try to communicate the results of scientific research, I want to give you a super brief history of climate science. So this is like 12 things you should know about climate science if you know nothing else. Okay, so what do we know about the history of climate science? We know that scientists have understood since the 1850s that carbon dioxide was a greenhouse gas, that it's highly transparent to visible light, but much more opaque to infrared radiation. So it heats up the Earth. The Earth would be freezing cold if we didn't have water and carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. We've also known since the early 1900s that if we increase carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, there was a good likelihood that it would lead to a warming of the Earth. And in fact, we've known since the early 1900s that if you doubled carbon dioxide, there was a good chance you'd get a temperature increase of about a, somewhere between 2, 3, 4 degrees centigrade. And we've known since the 1930s that carbon dioxide was, in fact, increasing. And there was a possibility already suggested by Guy Calendar at that point that there might be detectable increases in temperature associated with those measurable increases in carbon dioxide. So these are things that have been known scientifically for a very long time. As this audience well knows, these ideas were sort of brewing over a period of quite a few years, but brought together in a rather persuasive way by our own Roger Revelle and Hans Seuss, who in an article in 1957 argued that the time had come to monitor carbon dioxide carefully in order to understand its impact on the Earth's climate because the potential changes could be extremely far-reaching. That monitoring, again, as many people here know, was undertaken in the late 1950s, actually began in 1958, an easy year for me to remember because that's when I was born. Uh, me and the Killing Curve were born together, so it's kind of destiny that I'm doing this work. Um, 
So as you know, Dave Killing began in 1958 to do that monitoring of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But there's a lot more to the history, too, that many people don't know. They don't know that already by the mid-1960s, a number of leading scientific groups were writing reports in which they were warning the federal government of the possibility of major social, economic, and other impacts as a consequence of uh, increased carbon dioxide. And uh, many of the detailed predictions of these reports have turned out to be surprisingly prescient. Moreover, and this is one of my favorite little known facts, we know that these reports actually made their way to the Johnson White House, and I spent a bit of time last year trying to figure out how the heck Lyndon Johnson s said this in a speech. And the answer is the speech was actually written by Bill Moyers, so I'm trying to track down Moyers. If anybody knows Bill Moyers, let me know, because I'd like to know how he found out about it. I assume it was from Ravel's report. But in any event, in 1965, Lyndon Johnson said in a special me message to Congress, this generation has altered the composition of the atmosphere on a global scale through a steady increase in carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels. 1965, and look at it, here's the Keeling curve up to 1965, well, right here. I mean, not much of the Keeling curve yet, here's the whole thing today, but already, just in a few years, in eight short years, you could see the steady increase clearly shown. By the 1970s, we see the growth of climate research as a major scientific research field with the, emerging, the emergence of uh, global general circulation models to try to analyze the impact of additional greenhouse gases and an emerging recognition of the likelihood of global warming from greenhouse gas increases. Moreover, by the late 1970s, we begin to see a growing mounting concern in the scientific community that the problem may be serious even grave. And from very mainstream members of the scientific community, like Robert White, the head of NOAA, uh, who wrote a major report for the National Research Council, the Jason Committee. Um, well, I don't know what I want to say about that here, except if you're interested, read my piece on this that was published in the Sunday Times a few weeks ago, um, and the National Academy of Sciences, the what's now the famous Charney Report, headed by MIT meteorologist Dual Charney. What's really interesting to me as a historian about this work is that if you read the documents around them, what you find is that these reports, this work, these were not little isolated outliers of maverick scientists saying things that nobody else was paying attention to. No, in fact, what you see is that actually the scientists involved believed in 1969 that they had a consensus, and that's their word, not mine. So in the National Academy of Sciences archives, I found this document, which was part of the proposal for the Charney Report, why the Charney Report needed to be written. And in this proposal, the scientists of the Academy wrote, a plethora of studies from diverse sources indicates a consensus there we go, that climate changes will result from man's combustion of fossil fuels and changes in land use. So that's a pretty clear statement of a consensus about a prediction about something that they believed would happen based on scientific principles um, from activities that they knew were going on already at that time. The Charney Report summed it up this way, if carbon dioxide continues to increase, we find no reason to doubt that climate changes will result and no reason to believe that these changes will be negligible. A lot of negatives in there, double, triple, and quadruple negatives, but still you get the point, right? No reason to doubt, no reason to doubt in 1979. Okay, fast forward nine more years. In 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was established to look in greater detail at these questions. And 1988 is a really important year because it's also the year in which climate modeler Jim Hansen testified in Congress that he was 99% certain that climate change was now detectable. That is to say that these predictions were in fact coming true and that you could see the human effect on climate, you could recognize that signal out of the noise of natural variability. Now when Jim Hans had said that in 1988, he was out on a limb. Probably the majority of climate scientists did not think at that point that they could in fact detect the signal above the noise. But within a few years, seven years later, that had changed and virtually the rest of the scientific community had come around to Hansen's position. So when the IPCC issued its second assessment report, which was really the first full report where they really took a position on anything, they wrote, the balance of evidence suggests a discernible human influence on global climate. Now lots of caveats, details, and all sorts of other things, but an emerging consensus that when you weighed the evidence, yes, it did appear that the evidence of the human fingerprint on climate was becoming, in their word, discernible. 
2001, the third assessment report of the IPCC put it this way, most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. And again, six years later, the fourth assessment report, most of the observed warming over the last 50 years is very likely to have been due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations. So that's what you get for six more years of climate research. You get an extra adjective. And finally, the fourth assessment report, which came out last year, according to the IPCC, warming is now unequivocal. How often have you ever seen that word in the scientific literature? Unequivocal and cannot be attributed to natural variability. They say, quote, the observed warming of the atmosphere and ocean together with ice mass loss support the conclusion that it is extremely unlikely that global climate change of the past 50 years can be explained without external forcing. Okay, so that's, that's the supercharged brief history of climate science. And what you see when you look at this long view from Tyndall to the present is you see that the scientific position of the IPCC really has not changed since 2001. So the last six years there's been really, we've added some adjectives, strengthening some language. Um, certainly many details are better understood. I don't mean to disparage or discredit the work of all the wonderful scientists who have been doing this, but the big picture the basic picture that this is a prediction that has now come true, that we do recognize the signal above the noise, um, that basic picture has been in place now for a number of years. In fact, as a historian, I was prompted to really think about what has changed not just since 2001, but what's changed since 1979? What's changed since the Charney and the Jasons and the NRC reports of the late 1970s? Well, I think the short answer is that what's changed is that climate change is no longer a prediction as it was in the late 1970s, it's now an observed fact. And as many of you know, there's lots and lots and lots of literature now from diverse sources showing all of the many different ways in which climate change is now observed. But here's the feel bad part. Do the American people know this? Do they understand this? Do they understand the robust nature of the scientific research? Do they understand the incredible diversity of evidence? Do they understand the consilience and consistency of that evidence? Do they understand what it is that scientists believe about this question they've been studying in detail for nearly 50 years? And the answer to that question appears to be not really, at least not a substantial proportion of our fellow American citizens. How do we know this? Well, there have been various public opinion polls, but a recent one last summer, the Yale Gallup poll uh, on public opinion on climate issues, I'm just cutting right to the quick here. When asked the question, which comes closer to your own view, most scientists think global warming is happening, or most scientists think global warming is not happening, or there's a lot of disagreement among scientists about whether or not global warming is happening, fully 40% of the American people said that they think that there's a lot of disagreement. The American people do not believe, or nearly half of us do not believe, that scientists have sorted this out. Moreover, 29% remain unconvinced that warming is even happening. I'm hoping that those are the same 29% who think that Saddam Hussein attacked us on 9-11. And 41% think that warming can be mostly or explained by natural variability. So this is really a staggering result given the scientific basis. Moreover, as some of you know, these Americans include John McCain's running mate. Uh, Leon Letterman was just complaining about this a moment ago, so I hope, Leon, you're appreciating this slide. Um, this is really worrisome, right? So just as recently as August, the Washington Post had an article about Sarah Palin's views on global warming, and they, they wrote, Sarah Palin told voters she wasn't sure climate change wasn't simply part of a natural warming cycle. Her spokesman clarified, so the Post reporter wanted to make sure he was getting it right, or he or she. Her spokesman clarified she's not totally convinced one way or the other. Science will tell us. She thinks the jury's still out. And in another interview with Newsmax online, what is your take on global warming? Palin replied, I'm not one who would attribute it to being man-made. So here we are, 50 years after Ravel and Zeus, 50 years after Dave Keeling began measuring carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, 30 years after the Charney Report, and more than a decade after the IPCC reached consensus that global warming was happening. And still, 40% of our fellow citizens expressed doubt about that, including a candidate to be the Vice President of the United States of America. So where does that leave us? Well, I think it leaves us in a pretty troubling state. So I wanted to leave us on the question, because I think this is something that 
you know, we need to be discussing here, right? What do we do? How do we respond to a situation like this where we know that and we see that there's this enormous disparity between the way the public view what's been going on scientifically and what we as scientists understand has in fact happened. And I'm hoping that it doesn't come to this. Thank you very much.